Welcome. My name is Jennifer Boyat. Thank you for joining me for the third edition of the Rise of the Peacemaker, a conversation with leading peacemakers. My intention is that for the next hour and some minutes, you'll be able to be inspired and to be renewed, to be able to then continue to go out and do the work of love and peace that you do in your corner of the world. It is time for our leaders to be peacemakers and for peacemakers to be our leaders. And I have four of um, these examples of peace here with me in circle today for Extraordinary Voices. I'd like to introduce to you Erin Corcoran. Erin is the Executive Director of the Kroc Institute of Inter uh, International Peace Studies at Notre Dame. She has worked throughout the years uh, in human rights and in defense of migrants and refugees and children. Erin, welcome and hello. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. Also with us is Lara Hansen. Lara is board president of Chill Sacramento, a center that supports inner peace. And uh, along with other leaders in her community, Lara is also involved in the Compassionate Capital Region and, the, and Compassionate Sacramento. Lara, hello. Oh, thank you for having me here. Andrew Benson Green Jr. is a board member of Maryland United for Peace and Justice. Andrew has spent his life creating nonviolence education and opportunities, especially for youth for whom war is part of their environment. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. And Jody Evans is a peace, environmental, uh, women's rights, and social activist. She's the co-founder of Code Pink, an organization that works to stop US military interventions. Jody, thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Jennifer, happy to be here with you. So I know for me um, and for many of our listeners, it's sometimes I don't feel like I'm strong enough. Sometimes I wonder if I have something to, to contribute. Sometimes I wonder where to start um if what i'm going to do is going to have any effect there's all kinds of worries that kind of cluster around um our desires to you know be of service to the, the people that we love to our communities to the world and so what i'd really like to do is hear from each of you about how you chose peace or how peace chose you or however you would like to you know clarify that if there's a different way that you would describe your calling and maybe um, as much of your backstory that you want to want to give or whatever, just how you got where you where you are, and and then maybe kind of um, uh, you know maybe the decisions you made or the commitments you made, and, um, and then kind of end by talking about what you're involved in now, what you're committed to now, and what you're passionate about now. Um, and uh, Laura, let's let's hear from you. Thank you. Well, to talk about the first part of your question, Jennifer, of how, how did it start and what was the, the backstory? And for me, it started with wanting inner peace. Um, you know, all, all of us or most of us have tricky childhoods. And um, I really was looking for how do I Kind of live with myself? How do I go through this life and have some kind of contentment or at least not so much chaos? And that led me uh, to uh, be very involved in the community at a young age and just to keep to keep busy, uh, to, to volunteer, to work. And after college, where I studied uh, political philosophy and economics, really understanding uh, our world kind of on a systemic level and how specifically, how do governments control their, their occupants, their citizens and residents? I was very interested in 
how do you work with a group? Um, how do you create a, a safe space or any, any type of culture? And with that perspective, um, after college, I entered a, a seminary where I went within so that I could find that piece and then work to understand how do we relate to each other? How do we cause pain for each other through our you know, self-interest and not having uh, any consideration for the people around us and their situation. That, that took me about 25, 25 years, which is most of my uh, adult life, to get to a place where I could be at peace within myself, no matter where I was or who I was with. And my next question was, how do I, what do I do now? What do I do out in the community where pain is everywhere? And there was one, one person that I met uh, back in 2012, I think. And her name is Laura O'Connor. And I met her through the Charter for Compassion uh, statewide organization called Compassionate California. And she was an organizing team member. And she and I were talking about of our, our life stories and what we wanted to do in the world. And she, she said, have you looked at where you are as a white woman in American society? You know, you're interested in you know, reducing suffering. You're interested in creating spaces and places where people can find peace, find understanding uh, between each other and also within each of us. And, and it took me a minute to realize that I was looking at my work and my calling and my desire without considering my own programming or indoctrination in society and kind of the dominant culture. And that, that took me on an, a deeper path. And I believe it was the right path of taking what I learned in college about how governments are organized and the strategies and the tactics they use to influence uh, public opinion or to control uh, their citizens and residents. And I then looked at that, that through that lens at uh, American society and went, okay, I need to put the pieces together of colonization, um, racism, uh, dominant culture strategies and practices. And what have I chosen to be blind to? Because I was trained to be, I was programmed to be. And that has been, I would say the last 10 years uh, of my inner work is continuing to, to peel the layers off of that and look at where I don't want to look. What don't I want to see? Um, and to ask myself the question, what is mine to do? And how do I how do I be in relationship with all of the community leaders from all sectors? And I I have a lot of, of women to thank um, for being my mentor, uh, being the flashlight to shine where I don't want to look. And, um, and they continue to be kind of my circle of mentors and advisors and friends 
Um, and they're also community partners of Compassionate California and Compassionate Capital Region and the, the other cities kind of in our region to create spaces where people from all communities can and all cultures can come together and just understand each other, understand their perspective, understand what their what their challenges are. And then taking those perspectives, taking that collective understanding uh, into action, into, into change in the communities. So it's really been a journey of self-interest moving to collective self-interest. And how do you and, and how you do that? So the programs that we've created are in the greater Sacramento area and also statewide with Compassionate California are creating spaces within cities and within communities where it's safe to be you and you can learn and be heard to, under, to understand the other people in your community and also for them to understand you. Um, because if, if we understand how we're hurting each other and realize that we are, then it's much, it, then it's almost a no brainer to say, okay, well, let's, now that I know, let's not do that. Let's create something new. Let's make new decisions. Let's make new policy decisions. And scaling that up to policy is what I'm interested in doing next, is how do you create enough leverage and a convincing enough argument that collective self-interest is has a better bottom line uh, it's better for our environment. It's better for our public health and safety. But man, that's a tough nut to crack. But this isn't uh, the work of a year. It's the work of, it's not even the work of a lifetime. It's the work of generations. And that's the intention with the Compassionate Cities Movement is for it to be generational. It's slow, it's deep, deep root uh, building. Uh, so that over time, we make decisions differently about how we create our communities, our cities, and, and how we treat each other. So thank you for letting me, letting me share that. And uh, with all of us, there's so much more. But I wanted to make sure that I, I got that out there. Of, I needed to find healing for myself first and find peace first and then begin to look around me and, and see what I'm a part of unconsciously and get more conscious and understand the systems that I'm in and the systems that we're in and to come out of it, for all of us to come out of that and, and create something new together. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That, that's a beautiful beginning. And I liked your question, what is mine to do? And um, also, you know, when we're talking about peace, we are also talking about pain, aren't we? That's those, it's a way of engaging with our pain as opposed to all the other ones we've tried. <laughs> um, lovely. I'd love to hear from Erin. And she's pretty much going to, you know, give her story as well. Thank you, Erin. Unmute, my dear. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, thank you, Laura, for sharing your, your story and journey. It was really inspiring to hear from you. Um, so I think I'll start by sort of framing where I think sort of my work has been in this space of peace um, with the idea that without justice, there can be no peace um, and sort of the importance of, of justice. And so I'm trained as a lawyer uh, and I started out wanting to go to law school to work on um, bringing human rights abusers accountable uh, for uh, human rights violations around the world, um, feeling that people who have been victimized by these abuses 
um, need to feel that in order to sort of heal, part of that healing requires sort of accountability um, and, and, and sort of wanting to learn different ways in which how accountability might met out. It doesn't necessarily have to always be punitive, but sort of understanding, um, wanting to understand different systems for accountability um, in, in the context of trying to find justice and seek justice. Uh, and so in that work, I, um, my third year in law school, I was involved in a, a clinical program, which is basically where law students are matched with faculty members and actually are able to act as sort of lawyers in training um, before different various tribunals. And I was um, fortunate enough to represent a woman from Sudan, Khartoum, Sudan, who was fleeing um, persecution at the hands of the government um, because her family, while her father was an imam in a mosque um, outside of Khartoum, her family believed in sort of the importance of sort of religious tolerance and sort of inter interfaith conversations and dialogues, and also the importance of sort of um, limits on what the government can mandate with views vis-a-vis -vis religion. And so this was a, a government at the time that was in sort of um, religious extreme extremism. Um, and so she fled and was being, her family was being hunted down. She had been arrested and detained. And I represented her before an immigration judge um, in, in uh, Maryland. And in that process, I learned that, you know, what was really important for her was actually, you know, finding safety um, and being able to rebuild her life. But I also sort of became really, um, interested in sort of the causes of the, of the reasons why she was fleeing, sort of the, not just her individual um, experiences, but sort of the more structural issues that were happening in her country, the international response to those, uh, those um, situations. And then also just our own refugee system in the United States and the refugee system at large. So oftentimes refugees are, I think, emblematic of failed states or fragile states where peace is maybe lessening or in some ways sometimes gone and so they are the faces and the individuals that are sort of in search of peace and my role as, an, as a lawyer and an advocate was to help them try to find that peace in other uh, places but I also became um, you know it also became very apparent to me that these conflicts um, are very complicated and there's a lot of different things that go into them um, and it's um, and, and including sort of power and governments and military and greed and um, and so I became really interested in also just trying to understand conflict and, re and reasons for conflict. Uh, and so that led me to sort of um, continuing to, I worked in the, gov the US government for a while um, on policy issues related to migration and immigration and also the criminal justice system. Uh, and sort of ultimately um, really found that I really enjoyed teaching. And so I, I really enjoy kind of helping people think differently about different issues, challenge their assumptions, myself have my own assumptions challenged and, and sort of learn from conversation and dialogue. Um, and so I um, spent about eight years as a law professor in, in New Hampshire um, working on what I would call sort of social justice issues, um, both teaching them and then it sort of in the community ranging from trying to deal with the abolishing the death penalty in New Hampshire to working on finding places for refugees to resettle, uh, as well as you know, ensuring people had heat in their homes during the winter, right? Working with legal service providers to make sure that basic needs were being met. Um, and so, you know, sort of my, I think, where I sort of saw myself kind of in, in the peace place is sort of this social justice realm and the law. And then this incredible opportunity um, came to me about four years ago, exactly, um, where I was offered, um, the opportunity to come and be the executive director of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame here in South Bend, Indiana. And um, it, was it was really exciting because I, um, a lot of the faculty that are here and staff that are here are coming, at, looking at peace in a lot of different um, lenses and disciplines. But what's sort of central to our program and what is the founding for the reason the program exists is this um, Joan B. Kroc wanted to provide opportunities for peacemakers around the world who are working on issues of peace in their own countries and their own cities, communities, um, an opportunity to come and study at Notre Dame um, and get a master's in peace studies and be in, um, create this intentional community of, of, of peace builders um, 
and then go back out into the world with a sort of theoretical framework of understanding peace. Um, and so it's, we have over 1800 alumni now um, around the world, all over the world, doing incredible things um, in local communities, at the UN and the federal government. Um, uh, some of them are in exile, I mean, just a, a whole range. And, and they are, we've able, been able to connect them together. Um, and so that's been really an exciting thing here at the Kroc Institute. And I've also become, became much more aware of that sort of what they refer to here as positive peace, um, sort of just that the absence of, of armed conflict or direct violence isn't necessarily all that you need to make the world peaceful, right? That we have to address some of the issues that Laura really was, it was talking about within our communities, structural issues, um, cultural violence, um, issues around um, people being able to live their lives with, with human dignity. These are kind of things that are really important. And I think for me, what I've really learned um, in teaching peace studies courses now to undergraduate and graduate students and really becoming more immersed in some of the theoretical frameworks of uh, peacemakers around the world that um, we all individually um, have a role to play in making our, our communities, our homes, our schools uh, safer, um, more just, a place where we can sort of have a difference of ideas and sort of talk those things out. So that's been really, um, I think, been really exciting for me. And then I'll just quickly end with some, a project that the Institute's working on that I think is really exciting. Um, and it brings together some of our alumni from around, um, they're kind of right now or in the United States, but um, have had to flee Afghanistan. Um, and we're working with uh, faculty and practitioners on helping to get people out of Afghanistan, but also sort of looking at how Afghanistan might need to be rebuilt um, and being in conversation with people around the world um, about sort of um, a path forward um, globally. So that's been really an exciting and engaging uh, uh, project today. There was actually some really interesting conversations with Afghans in Afghanistan, along with members from the US government and some different practitioners in, at the Kroc Institute, just sort of having informal dialogues of what's necessary and needed to sort of move forward and have a more just and peaceful Afghanistan. So that's really exciting. So I'll end there. Um, but so thank, thank you, you Aaron. For... <laughs> yeah, and, you, Aaron. and when I got this image of when you were talking about the, your alum what and I, I just get this image of seeds being planted and uh, it was um, and that's what we all, that's all that we all can do is be that seed and, and keep planting other ones. And that's beautiful. Um, and I think we're seeing too that, that theme where Laura began with it and really any of us who, who've done this for any length of time that that inner peace, it's, it, you can't separate it out. It's, it's what the individual experience is based on their community and the community experience is based on our, our uh, healing our individual experience too. So that's beautiful. Jody, let's let's hear from you. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer, for bringing us together and for your passion for peace. It's of course, it starts inside of us. Um, in 1970, I was a maid making $1.87 an hour, and the brothers of my friends were coming home from Vietnam in body bags. So I joined the movement to end the war in Vietnam and to get 18-year-olds, since they were dying for our country, uh, the right to vote. Uh, in 1972, I was one of the youngest people ever to vote. We stopped the war. Um, we organized for a living wage and won. So early on, I knew success. Being part of the campaign for president of peace candidate George McGovern in 72 brought me into a political committee in LA where I was going to college. And one night at a volunteer party, I met Jerry Brown, who was the state chair of McGovern's campaign and spent the next 25 years working with Jerry, eight years as governor, I was director of administration and still the youngest member of the governor's cabinet of the state of California. Also part of two of his presidential bids, but the campaign manager for the one in 92, which centered on a platform for peace and progress. 
our issue is money out of politics or it doesn't matter what you care about, the money will win and the needs of the people, planet and peace will lose. We took only $100 in no PAC money and we started with nine in the race and were the last one standing when Bill Clinton won. But at the end of the race was the Watts uprising after the Rodney King verdict. So I began working in Watts with Akilah Shirelles, who the night before had accomplished a peace treaty between the Crips and the Bloods. Money was taken from the police for community-led safety, and we started a nonprofit to serve the community and teach gang members life skills. In this process, I learned that most of those gang members' fathers had been in the war in Vietnam, and the war had come home to this community. Their fathers had not been cared for, and many were homeless or still addicted to the drugs. I learned that in 20 years, 20,000 people had been killed in Watts, and no one talked about it, but it was literally a war zone. In 2000, I produced a peace conference in Croatia at the end of the Bosnian War with youth from all the Balkan states. And listening to the stories of the women and youth about the layered costs of war, the horror of war became more real in my heart and mind. We live in the US where it happens elsewhere. So in 9-11, 2001, I wanted to do everything I could to stop the US from attacking Afghanistan and was thrilled when at least one member of Congress spoke about the folly, immorality, and tragedy of war. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, my hero. She's proved to be right these 20 years later as Afghanistan is collapsing from 20 years of this war on terror that has cost US taxpayers $21 trillion. It's cost the world millions of lives and displaced millions of people. The destruction of five countries, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Libya, and Iran, and the destabilization of the Middle East. When in September 2002, I hear that President Bush wants to go to war in Iraq, a fully innocent country, secular with no ties to Al-Qaeda, actually they hate each other, and no one from 9-11 was from Iraq, and they clearly don't have weapons of mass destruction. They've been under a decade of sanctions that killed 500,000 children that Secretary of State Madeleine Albright thought was acceptable collateral damage. Hearing it, I thought about Watts and how the war comes home. Vietnam was an innocent country attacked by the US on a lie and millions died and it cost US taxpayers too much and deeply wounded and divided the United States. It also reminded me of the cops in Watts who could kill a young black boy and say maybe he had a gun in their pocket when they clearly didn't. So here was the US president playing that out, seeing a country, a people of color might have a gun in their pocket so he could kill them. I jumped on a plane to DC to take my primal scream of no outside the White House. I met up with friends there, including my partner, Medea Benjamin, and we called code pink because Bush was frightening the American people into war with color-coded alerts, orange, red, and yellow. We called code pink for peace. We started a daily vigil outside the White House to say no to war, and we were part of organizing 12 million in the streets of the world before Bush denied the voice of the people and committed shock and awe on the people of Iraq. While we were in our vigil outside the White House, we decided to go to Iraq and see for ourselves. So in February, a month before the invasion, we spent 10 days in Iraq. It had been rendered so poor by the US sanctions that the UN was feeding the people and there was no military, and it was beyond a joke that we would be frightened of this country full of beautiful people. It was the most educated country per capita in the world before we invaded. And those brains are now spread around the world like the Tower of Babel that originated there. We loved our time and were deeply saddened when Bush said he would bomb after Secretary Powell lied to the UN. I was there that day and watched the people of Iraq go into terror as the thought of those bombs dropping on them. And I thought, here we are in the United States having just experienced the terror of 9-11 and we're gonna cause that and worse to happen to these people, shame on us. So for the last 20 years, we have been working to end war. We wrote a book, Stop the Next War Now, as we hadn't stopped the Iraq war, but we needed to stop the next one and that target was Iran. 
We feel we have done that in so many ways. And right now the US is very close to being back in peace talks with Iran, which is heartening. Yet the sanctions have depleted this vibrant country and the middle class has been destroyed. Even on my last visit though, the poorest of the poor offer you tea and sweets. The media takes us to war with lies that other countries are evil and the US is good. Instead, it must always be war is evil and diplomacy is good. Besides working to stop the next war, we work to expose the cost of drones in the Obama administration and went to Pakistan and Yemen to speak with the families of drone victims, bringing their stories back to Congress and the president. On Kill Tuesdays, Obama would instruct the bombing of thousands with drones and after our work, it dropped to hundreds. We have worked to stop Saudi Arabia and all the armed cells there, including getting a War Powers Act through Congress twice, only to be rejected by Trump. But we're starting a new one to stop the US engagement on the Yemen, which is illegal, immoral, and devastating. What we do to Yemen is shameful on the lives of every US citizen. We've been a partner with the boycott divestment sanction campaign of the for the people of Palestine since it began running two of the most successful campaigns against Ahava and SodaStream, who left the occupied territories. We took almost a thousand people to Gaza in six trips and organized the Gaza Freedom March in 2009 after Operation Kess led from Israel bombed Gaza. We staged protests in Tahrir Square and Cairo when they blocked our entrance. We've worked to free the people of Cuba from the brutal sanctions of the US and have taken over a thousand people to help our campaign to lift those sanctions. Obama opened the door and lifted many of the sanctions and travel bans only to have the worst in history put back in place by Trump and then reinforced by Biden. This year, we raised over $750,000 to deliver all the syringes they needed for their vaccines. 92% of Cuba is now vaccinated and we've delivered food and recently powdered milk for those who are being starved to death by sanctions. We closed down the book tours of the war criminals of the Iraq war. We have a card deck of 52 of them in our store and attempted citizens arrests across the country. We disrupted Congress for years to bring an end to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. When Trump was elected, we moved out of DC into the communities. First, because the global inequality climate chaos and $2 trillion of weapons sold each year is the path being laid to fascism. And we need to be building what I call arcs to get us through this flood. You know, all myths of civilization have a flood and we are in ours. So we launched Divest from the War Economy, Cultivate Your Local Peace Economy. In the US, we are part of a war economy. It is our culture. It is the destructive, extractive, oppressive economy that is killing us, our communities, and the planet. And it has developed some bad and unhealthy habits in us. But we can cultivate our local peace economy, the giving, sharing, caring, thriving, relational, resilient economy, without which none of us would be alive. COVID taught us what is really essential. So at Code Pink, we give tools for divesting and cultivating and fantastic new local projects are happening that are creating the future. Laura is doing this work in her community. But we also launched a campaign to divest from the war machine itself to show that all communities are invested in war. They're making a killing on killing. Our schools, churches, cities, and states. So across the country, communities work to end the investment in weapons companies who are driving war. We launched a feminist foreign policy project to show that the way to peace is led by feminist values, where militarism is replaced by cooperation and diplomacy, where poverty is eradicated by replacing capitalist structures of exploitation with sharing compassionate economies that take care of all people, where the goals of environmental protection, racial equity, and gender equality govern our policy decisions and where international solidarity is the guiding principle of our foreign policy. So with COVID closed the doors between the US and China, I started to notice Chinese hate and it felt like pre-Iraq war times and seeing lies and hate towards a country we need to be cooperating with on pandemics, global climate change and the global community we are part of. 
So we launched China is not our enemy to educate the insanely stupid American public about China. The xenophobia that has been driven by hate from leaders at the top and through the media and much miseducation through our lives has created a 3,000% increase in Asian hate attacks and deaths. This affects all people of Asian descent in the Americas and because Americans can't tell the difference. We must stop the lies and see that we will only survive if we're in cooperation with China as they also have nuclear weapons. And we drop a few of those and we have a nuclear winter where nothing grows and we all die. Not a game to be playing here. So I spend much of my time educating on China. Laura talked about the need to cultivate collective self-interests. We have a lot to learn from China. And now the US is pushing for Ukraine to join NATO, which breaks our agreements with Russia. So we put all the people of Ukraine in danger and much of Europe. The US is pushing to destroy Russia at any cost, it seems, and we are calling for diplomacy. So far, our actions are working. We organized 77 actions around the country last weekend, and the Menendez bill to fund military support in Ukraine is not making it through Congress, where many of the members are calling through diplomacy because it is clear that diplomacy here will and can work and the saber rattling has got to stop. Ukrainians have called on the US upset that they've been put in the middle and the terrorizing it is calling, causing their people. And I personally am upset that those weapons we're selling are going to neo-Nazi groups in Ukraine. And you know, they'll be back in the United States just before election time. We are part of a campaign to unfreeze the money of Afghanistan to release it so that the starving people of Afghanistan have food to eat. We continue to build a peace movement locally with our call to disarm campaign to stop the sale of weapons that is inflaming violence around the world. To come to peace, we must stop the weapons trade. On 9-12-2022, we launched a different response to 9-11, and that is the shrinking of the Pentagon budget. You know, follow the money. Without the money, this violence and destruction would not be happening. Our Cut the Pentagon campaign is a big tent of all the groups that come to DC looking for support. The money's in the Pentagon budget, 65% of your tax dollars. Remember that when you're signing your check. We have been in action every day in the streets in DC and across the country, raising up the needs of the people and the planet and pointing to where the money is. We will continue until June 18th when we'll be joined by the Poor People's Campaign, a call for moral revival that stands on the shoulders of Martin Luther King Jr.'s Poor People's Campaign and call for an end to the three evils, racism, poverty, and militarism. You can join us at codepink.org to engage locally or join us in DC in June. I look at the world and the devastation and insane violence of war in too many countries costing too much and my heart breaks. But as we say it could pink, the only recognizable feature of hope is action. And being in action takes away the anxiety and the grief as engagement is how we create change. And change is what we must. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. That was marvelous. And I think um, what we've been hearing from several, well, from so far is we have to keep challenging ourselves and what we know and our assumptions um, and do that proactively. And um, also that it, the ways society being as it is, you know, um, money is a reality of how we exchange energy, how we make decisions of, I always, I've always heard that money is our vote. And we, we are in the middle of locally and as, as Jody has presented um, nationally about where that flow goes. And we need to keep raising our voices about that in this time. And her personal story is kind of intertwined with our, we've gotten a good history lesson I think <laughs> about why we're on the, where we're at right now and 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 uh, on the verge of the some of the movements and and um, issues that we find ourselves in it's beautiful thank you and on a personal note I actually have one of my best friends lives in Iran and he just this morning sent me pictures of the Gulf 
And the silver wires, I can't imagine anything I would want to bomb there. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. We're going to hear from Andrew now. He's got a wonderful story that I can't wait for you to hear. So Andrew, will you share with us? Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks to um, the other presenters, Laura, Erin, Judy, for setting the pace here. I mean, we all know how it works. Peace building can be sometimes frustrating for peace activists. It is challenging experience, but with the kind of energy like we demonstrate here, the passion and the commitment, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. There is always hope. And with this hope comes our own nature to inspire others in our generation to change the way they are. Um, I was born and raised in Sierra Leone in West Africa, which like Erin um, may have noted, is a, one of the fragile states that have been engulfed by an all out violence and war. And these instabilities really created a lot of um, impact for many of the young generations at the time, including myself. I was in college at the time between the 90s where I became aware of these many challenges of the many problems that our country was facing. And at the heat of the war, whilst I was doing my undergrad, I was opportune to have to meet with other young peace activists of my ilk who were also very interested in promoting peace and human rights work. So in 1993 to 1998, whilst I was doing an undergrad in international relations, civil law and English, I met with um, Sheku Kamara, who was actually spearheading Peace Child International um, on the local level on a club campus. And I joined forces with Sheku to create peaceful programs on a local level to create awareness about the need to promote peace. I always believe that peace is not only a core human value, but it is a core human right. And for every generation that is confronted with different challenges, there needs aspiring people to help come into the free to help civilize societies. I found myself working with Sheku to create peaceful programs. I also work with um, Peace Links programs on campus with a friend of mine as well, who, is, who was also a young peace activist, Vandi Kanyaku, who was also very um, instrumental in local peace efforts. During those years of college life, I became aware of the challenges that the war brought. And you know, in 1997, at the peak of the first instabilities that created the government to be ousted through military interventions, I escaped to Guinea in Conakry, where I was a refugee for a year with my family. But whilst I was there, I didn't sulk to the problems of being a refugee. I looked at the possibilities of helping people in the communities there and other compatriots of mine. So I also met with a colleague of mine, um, Abdullah Beriti, who was working with the Campaign for Good Governance. And he asked me to join the forces to help create advocacy materials for the restoration of democracies in Sierra Leone. So I joined the Campaign for Good Governance in Guinea whilst I was a refugee, creating these advocacy materials with the hope of creating awareness not just in Guinea, but across the world about the plight of Sierra Leone. When the war um, finished and the government was reinstated in 1998, I had to return to Sierra Leone to finish my undergrad. And during that time, I wrote my dissertation on the issues of gender politics and the role of women, knowing that peace programs have been supported and democracies have been supported on all fronts by women as well as young people. So whilst finishing my undergrad, there erupted another skirmishes of war that was the 1999 invasion of Sierra Leone. And this was the climax of the war that really created the international community to understand the, the level of atrocities that have been going on for the last 10 years. Um, when the war 
subsided and I was already on my own, finished my undergrad and I was looking for some kind of direction and hope, although I've had this peace background before, but I was thinking about what can I do with my undergraduate degree? I wanna swap into law and do law as, as, as properly and thus get my degree or just look at what is on the ground. So I, I thought that let me look at what I can do to help create opportunities for children affected by war. So there are four aspects of my intervention. One is democratization. The second is human rights. The third is peace building. And the fourth is innovation and creativity. So in the midst of the democratization programs, I helped with the, the DDR program. I worked with Defense for Children International um, on the issues of human rights. I worked with the International Educational Resource Network, which I co-founded in Sierra Leone um, in 1999, where I developed the concept of opportunities for youth and children, because I realized that just saying peace, you know, live in peace and nonviolence without the opportunities that could bear will not create the necessary change that you want, because peace has to come with opportunities. It's hard to provide a leverage for people to overcome the challenges that they have, to overcome poverty, to be able to live without hunger and starvation, to have the basic necessities of life, clean water, etc. So with that in mind, I thought of how can I generate programs that could help to build not just the peace, but education, hope, and transformation in the lives of young people. So I caught up with the International Education and Resource Network in New York through Dr. Edgar Gad, who became my first contact. And he said, what can you do in Sierra Leone to help create awareness about your peace program through telecommunications? As a result of that, I talked with the local government through the Minister of Youth and Sport, Dr. Dennis Bright, who welcomed the idea of me creating innovative centers for peace programs. Um, I shipped my first computers from Computer Aid International in UK, going back and forth in England to help raise awareness about it and shipping them and setting up the computers in such a way that, you know, children can have a safe environment where they could learn and grow and train. Um, thanks to the Minister of Youth and Sport at the time uh, who created the initial center, I was opportune to provide 20 workstations and connected them to the internet. But before that time, I had the obligation to move to computer centers, internet cafes and shepherd young people from different cafes so that they could have some time on the internet. So the time we had was helping us to showcase their, you know, their stories about you know, how they got involved in the war as child soldiers. Um, I decided to expand the program beyond just who affected you, those who have fought in the war as child soldiers to include all and sundry students from a variety of schools in the country. I started to speak at different schools, you know, encouraging teachers and principals to be aware about how innovation can help in transforming information at a steady space and can create connections that will heal and create peaceful coexistence beyond borders. So, the centers grew to include schools in communities where I shipped computers and helped set them up for schools. Um, the Child Soldiers Project actually had its root in a friendship between myself and a Canadian teacher, Bill Belsey in Alberta in Canada. And the two of us talked collaboratively about what we can do to help the children of Sierra Leone heal from the war. We met in China in the summer of 2000 and I shared my stories about peace promotion and human rights and how technologies can help to facilitate that. And he was moved by you know, the, the steadfastness and my courage to create this kind of opportunities. So on returning home, I was able to get his support through letters that he sent as a moral support that could help my projects to go on. This created further connections. I was able to connect with War Child Canada. Uh, we developed a project called the No War Zone. This was a collaborative project that helped children in the war zones to talk and about their, the effects of war in their lives, their families and the communities through storytelling, through art. The project expanded in three other countries affected by conflicts 
in Colombia, in Angola, in Afghanistan. And all three countries were able to adapt the project. And in 2003, um, the Cable and Wireless China Awards at the Science Museum in London recognized our efforts as one of um, the best digital ideas that could create opportunities for children. This endorsement was very significant because it created added impetus for our work. It created the platform so that we can expand. The UN recognized our efforts as well. Um, as a result of that, I was able to create 25 schools in the country with connections to different schools across the world where they could share messages of peace, you know, understanding and hope, and just cultures and intercultural dialogue and, you know, things like that. These connections were very vital because it provided young people with the opportunities, not just within their communities, but to see beyond borders. It also provided hope for children in different countries commiserate with their pride, you know, sharing thoughts of empathy, you know, encouraging them in the face of the high odds they faced. Um, as the program grew, I was able to include other programs like videos, documentaries, creative writing, short stories, drama, and these were also helpful in the healing process. These opportunities also chiseled in young people the fact that they are not just victims of war, but it could be transformative agents in societies. Many of them went on to be videographers, worked on radio and TV. Many of them have created their own innovation centers to replicate the initial center. As the work grew, I was able to share my experiences in over 30 countries about my work um, and developing training and curricular programs that have been used in education for peace and nonviolence. Um, when Ebola outbreak struck, I was able to move, having set other structures like the Digital Hope Project, which helped victims of amputation to use technology as, as a way to heal. And then here in Maryland, I worked with the Peace Alliance in DC and was there a couple of times to showcase my work. And there was an occasion where I met a peace activist known as Joyce Lang. And she introduced me to the Maryland United for Peace and Justice, um, realizing that we were all talking alongside the same initiatives of peace. And she said, I mean, you can have a platform where you can also share your work, irrespective of the challenges and circumstances you're going through. You can be part of our efforts. So when I joined the Maryland United for Peace and Justice, I was able to contribute in many ways, not just as a board members, but also to do grant writing, to also create awareness by working on um, a lot of other legal issues and writing support letters for the organizations. So at this point, my, my main focus is creating opportunities for children who have you know, experienced the aspect of Ebola and who are surviving these through the Be Gifted Foundation, a local nonprofit organization, which I also co-created and started. Um, I thank you for listening. Andrew, thank you so much. And I just love hearing the people that you've affected in your lifetime. And the thing that jumped out at me was, as you said, that peace re uh, needs, you have to have opportunities for peace. And so, that's, I never heard, quite heard a uh, thought about it that way, but that makes complete sense. Um, is, there, is there anything coming up for anyone that they'd like to comment or any questions? I mean, I have a couple in my mind, but I'd love to give the floor if anybody had something arising from themselves. I think, um, and go ahead and you know raise your hand or whatever if that does come up. But what I'd love to hear from each of you now um, is to kind of, and you can answer this on the personal level or the community level, the world level, whatever whatever comes up for you. And and we we all know that peace is not just one thing. But for the question, if you could narrow it down to one thing, like just just for a second. What is the what is in our way 
what is the barrier or the misunderstanding or the, the, the human habits that the habit that we have that always is not always, but that is getting in the way of us making that leap or that that big change or um, in into peace. Um, if you've ever thought about it that way, I don't know. Um, that if we were to heal that one thing um, would make a big difference. Um, and if anybody wants to raise their hand, otherwise I can call on someone if you have an idea. Um, Jody. I'm sure. So um, it, at the personal level, it's the um, place where we can accept um, who we are and the abundance of the world we live in and where in some way maybe we've been wounded or um, felt trauma and there's a sense of separation um, and we create other in a way that um, uh, judges, denies, uh, reduces um, that sense of power over to give sense of self. Um, in our communities, it's, um, you know, where we see communities that learn to live in community, uh, because the word, even just the word community is like, how do we live together? How do we share? How do we care? Um, how do we build resilience? And the structures that we live inside of capitalism, imperialism, uh, patriarchy, they create these habits that we're rewarded for. Um, for following separation instead of realizing that we live in abundance and that we're nourished with relationship, um, we're rewarded for the opposite and we're made to believe that we live in scarcity and that we've got to get from the other. And, um, and then on the global level, it's power, you know, it is patriarchy, imperialism, capitalism, um, and it's somebody wanting to be Right now, we live in the United States that wants to destroy everyone but itself and doesn't realize that's, in the end, a really bad plan. Um, so it's never, you know, empires are crushed for that. Uh, why not be just part of a global community that um, learns how to get along? And you don't learn how to get along with weapons. You don't take a gun to the, you know, to diplomacy. And so we, we reward and we fund weapons of war. We don't fund diplomacy. We don't, the State Department that's supposed to be the diplomat is drive is the one driving wars right now because it is about, you know, hegemony. And it's about sharing, you know, like, wait, getting along. It's about sharing, it's about caring. And I know in the work of the local peace economy, people always come back and realize, oh my God, I had a really bad habit. And why did I believe that? And I started giving things away and there's this field of generosity. Did you know there's this field of generosity we lived in? And I'm like, yeah, but we're told it's not there. And we're told to take, you know, protect and to, you know, scarcity. And, and that makes us crazy, basically crazy. And make irrational decisions that start at the personal, um, you know, but can be changed in the community. Um, because we also can't really change ourselves. We need community for our own change because we need feedback, we need love, we need support, we need to be held accountable for our commitments that we can always talk ourselves out of. So even at the core of it, it's, it's about community. And so for someone to be, I call it in the folly of fretting, yes, there's a lot to fret about, but I just call it the folly of fretting, you know, even, and I think I learned this in war zones, the beauty and the camaraderie and the joy, even in a war zone, because it's like you're caring for each other. So to know, even in the space we live in right now, where change is happening at a pretty radical rate, and it's hard to sometimes find the ground, um, the ground is, is in the community. And find one, nourish one, give yourself to one, be in, in service of one. But in there, you will find your inner peace, you will be creating peace because it's brick by brick. And you know, nobody here started the war on Afghanistan or Iraq, we didn't do that, we're citizens. We actually, most of the citizens didn't want that. But what we can do is recommit ourselves to peace and cultivate that locally. Thank you. And uh, you don't have to be a parent to understand this, but it's, it's, I mean, you would 
never tell your child, oh, your sibling upset you, so go ahead and go over there and punch them, you know? <laughs> so you'd never tell your, you wouldn't let your two-year-old do that, and yet we we have a, a nation that's kind of, a, that's acting like that. Um, Aaron, what do you think? And, and actually, you don't all have to answer each of those levels if there's one that comes up for you the most, but I love that Jody did that, but it's not necessary. But um, yeah, what do you think, Aaron? I mean, I think a couple of things. I mean, first, I mean, if you were to ask me sort of one thing that I think gets in the way of peace, I think would be fear, um, greed, and related to that is power. I mean, I think so. Um, and I also think the other thing that is is that peace is not necessarily the absence of conflict, right? I think um, we're human beings, we have differences, we disagree, we have different views and values and opinions. And so I think for me, this is more, I guess, at a personal and community level, but I think what's also important to think about is how can we be constructive in our differing views and not be alienating? Because I think that's where the fear piece comes in, right? So. Um, I think it's important for us to have spaces where we can disagree in healthy, constructive ways, because oftentimes in where you come together to find common ground um, is really, can be really cathartic and can be um, really transformative, right? So I, so I think that that's another thing to keep in mind that um, conflict is not inherently anti-peace, um, right? So it's sort of how we think about conflict and how we um, deal with that, I think, is um, is part of it. Um, but I think it's sort of a global macro level with respect to sort of violence. I think it's about making people afraid of the other um, in ways in which that you can then um, get more power and get more economic resources. Uh, um, and so I think that that's sort of at the global level, what I, I think. Um, but I, I just think that also human beings are really complicated. <laughs> um, and sort of, I think part of the work of, of, of doing sort of peace work is um, finding common ground, but also finding ways in which we can um, disagree in ways that still respects and understands each of us as valuable individual human beings. Thank you. Yeah, I think that peace is the opportunity to be completely realistic and not just saying, oh, we don't have these problems or, oh, we don't have these, like even the large emotions that we have, like being able to be angry and, but not have that anger move into oppression or damage or something like that. Like we, we absolutely have to have that realistic view of who we are and, and have a different approach though. Um, Andrew, what are your thoughts about the barriers? Um, on top of my head, I feel like one of the major barriers and impediments could well be um, the lack of sincerity of bubbles um, that makes it difficult for, for people to really, you know, create the enabling environment that they preach. I mean, there is a saying that you have to practice while you preach. I mean, there are circumstances over time that I've realized during the conflict times when um, organizations that remain um, pivotal in the transition process could say, we are preventing the war from happening, but underline that the, there's a trade of weapons. So how do you factor the two together? On the radio, you will be propagating that you want the end of the war and you work with other forces you know, trading armed conflicts and trading um, guns and weapons. So these these are opposing force factors, and they seem to sound very sincere purpose. So one of the major impediments could be lack of sincerity. You know, at some levels, um, I recall during the times of the conflicts when you know there was a sale of diamonds between you know. Sierra Leone uh, um, insurgent factions and some aspects of the international community or some other places around the world. And they were also saying that we want to end the war, but it was the conflict and the trade that was finding the flames of the war, allowing the transfer of weapons back to these communities that 
you know, seem to perpetuate the violence and increase the atrocities. So sincerity of purpose is important. I think another factor um, could be um, communities um, engagement. Um, most communities don't feel like they're engaged in particular, you know, um, development work. And even when conflicts may have ceased, if these opportunities are not there, and on the other side of the point, there are other communities that are having better opportunities. This, this contrast create, further creates conflict. And this um, seem to be one major factor that was responsible for certain conflicts to, co to continue in Africa and some parts of the world. Um, I also believe that there, the impediments will be um, um, lack of, uh, I would say uh, a more a more structured approach. Um, there are times when there will be the cessation of the war, but the approach is not well structured in a way that could bring everybody on the table to agree and to talk about what needs to be done. So there will be dissension from one part of the conflict whereas the other part will feel like they have achieved their goal. And all of a sudden it comes back to square one and conflict ensue. So I will say these are for now, some of the things I feel could create impediments towards peaceful um, coexistence. Thank you, Andrew. Laura, what are your thoughts? Well, I completely enjoy listening to all of your all of your stories and your perspectives and uh, in listening to your answers to this question, um, Jody, about competition and, and separation, that's really artificial. And that there's a field of generosity that's part of who we are as a human family. And Aaron, that idea that peace doesn't mean no conflict or challenge, that Peace is what we're striving for, and we move through challenges as part of that, but it's a practice, it's not an outcome. And Andrew, when you talked about the, the lack of sincerity and the commitment and what all that connected together for me was being committed to each other is what's in the way. When, when one person's committed to another, they're committing to each other. That means whatever we go through, the relationship with you is first. And what do I have to let go of to stay in relationship with you? How do we, how do we live this life together? And then scaling that up to this local policy what happens if a city government or a company decides, they decide to be committed to the community they're in? It changes everything. Nothing else, they're committed to nothing else except the others in their community. That changes every decision. Um, and on the global level, if we, choose to be committed to each other, then we step in and live in that field of generosity. So I, from my perspective, what's missing is our, on an individual level, on, on every other level up through the system to, to global, is we've decided not to commit to each other. He said, I don't want to. I'd rather destroy you. I'd rather imprison you. I'd rather um, deprive you. And that's the best I can do. I don't, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do anything else. So as many of us as possible, creating a different way, being in that field of generosity, creating situations where people are 
skill building around how do you stay committed to each other and be true to yourself and release the limits within you and understand what the other person's doing. That's a lifelong hardcore practice that is not easy. Um, and it's, it, I believe the only thing we're living for is how to be with each other and, and commit, which means we change, we transform personally and on every level when we decide to commit to someone else or a community and, and deciding I'm gonna to commit to this community and everyone committing. And then they get to figure out what that community looks like as they move through the challenges and stay committed instead of sliding back into that easy place of self-interest, of pure self-interest. Um, said, I'll, I'll just, you know, make a mess instead of creating something together. And that's what I loved about what you said, Andrew, about opportunity and creativity. If we commit to each other that anything is possible. Creativity just flows and it's remarkable. So I, I believe we have to keep doing what we're doing and, and inspire as many people as possible. To, to commit to this work and to commit to each other. Thank you, Laura. That was actually very moving. I um, The time has passed. So we're actually gonna close with one more brief question. I'm gonna give the question so that you can have a chance to think about it for a second. Then I'm gonna say a little bit in closing as well before we hear the answers. So really you're gonna have maybe about a minute for this. But um, again, knowing that it's not just one thing, but if you could give each of, you know, give our listeners one thing that they can do in the next 24 hours that would move the, the dial toward peace. Again, you could answer that on whatever level you would like to do that. Just give us all a little homework assignment. You know what I mean? So think about that for a second while I just invite everyone who's listening to uh, where you are listening to this video, there is also an entire page set up that um, gives a spotlight for each of these wonderful guests that, that you've been hearing from today. And I encourage you to check those out and dive a little deeper. There's links, there's books, there's um, opportunities to donate, there's opportunities to get involved, there's things you can listen to. So please take a moment and, um, and to do that. And so, yeah, um, Andrew, what's something that we can that we can each do in the next twenty four hours that uh, would help us move toward peace? Um, I would say, join a movement, go out, reach out, and connect with people who are making the change and making a difference every day because the world needs all of us, not just those in the forefront of peacemaking, but even those who are unfamiliar with the, the task at hand. And um, I would say, you know, move past whatever restraints you have and connect with an organization, a school club, um, a college club that promotes peace or human rights or any issues regarding social justice. And you are on the on the train to healing lives and changing the way the world is. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for being here today. Erin, what's your idea? Meet a neighbor that you don't know. So just I feel like sometimes we are so disconnected to the people that are in the closest proximity to us. So just to take a moment to shovel a driveway or to stop by and say hi or just to say hello. Um, and to connect to someone at just a real basic human level um, with no agenda would be my thing to do in the next 24 hours. I call it the power of the high. If you say hi to someone like passing by them on the street or your neighbor, you've already done more than 50% of people <laughs> will do. And I'm talking about myself because there have been plenty of times when I didn't say hi too. But yeah, power of the high. 
It means that you saw somebody and we all want to be seen. Uh, Laura, what's, what's your idea, Laura? It's similar to get to know your neighbor or at least introduce yourselves to them. It's um, next time you find yourself choosing the conflict rather than the person. And just having, just being a little bit more self-aware on when you created a separation, a division between you and the other person by putting an opinion in between or a judgment. And give yourself a moment to decide what would happen if I chose connection with that person instead, if I chose understanding. And just give yourself that gift, of that, of that opportunity to understand um, and to be side by side, not, not in opposition of each other. Thank you. And Jody? Uh, yeah, much of what everyone said, but I think it's to make the commitment to be engaged for peace. Um, we go to war because we're lazy. And um, I think that really making the commitment that and the recognition that we create the world every day. And what do you want? And that takes a commitment. And so I suggest making a commitment to peace that includes uh, saying hi to your neighbor. It includes uh, paying attention to how you see the world. And it includes engaging because it is that engagement that creates a future. And we want to create a beautiful, peaceful future. And it's going to take all of us. Thank you. And I really love what Laura said earlier, that peace is a practice, not an outcome. Because we all want peace, we all want to live peace, but not all of us want, well, we do want, but we want, got, have to find the strength to actually do peace as, as a practice, as a method, as a set of skills. And, uh, and so I really appreciate the perspective that each of you have brought today, Laura, Andrew, Aaron, Jody. thank you for giving your time. And to those of you who are listening, thank you for spending your time with us. And um, it is time for our leaders to be peacemakers and for peacemakers to be our leaders. And um, again, thank you and goodbye.